guys open up to John 14, New Testament, fourth book, John 14. Uh, verse 27 and on. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give you is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really loved me, you would be happy that I'm going to, be, to the Father who is greater than I am. I have told you these things before they happen, so when they do happen, you will believe. I don't have much more to talk to you because the ruler of the world approaches. He has no power over me. These are the wonderful words of Jesus. Jesus is telling each and every one of us that Jesus is leaving. Well, he's telling the apostles he's leaving um, and that instead Holy Spirit will come. But he also tells us that Jesus is leaving us this wonderful gift. This gift that we cannot find anywhere else. He says, the world, it cannot give you a gift like this. He's saying, I'm giving you a gift of peace of mind and peace of heart, right? Like, uh, uh, like no trouble. Like, I'm giving you my peace, other translation says. So, the title of my message today is Peace Through God's Promises. Peace Through God's Promises. And all of us... I know we get anxious and I know we get stressed, but we must connect with God and we must find this peace. Um, and we'll see how further on through the message. Um, right now we're considered kind of a difficult of times, right? We have an election coming up and we have all these crazy things happening that are being discussed by our government, right? We have, uh, what's going on here? We have uh, national debt, border control, war in the Middle East, Russian threat, gun laws, terrorist acts, taxes, fraud, and which lives matter. Um, so all, all of these, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus told us 2,000 years ago, which lives matter and died for all of us. Thank you. But um, the point is, the point is um, that all the, we, we're, we're, it's considered that we're living in difficult times, uh, and um, God, He is never changing, and God has given us these wonderful promises. Um, speaking of change, you guys know why we change? We change because we learn something new, or we find a better way to do something, right? And so we adapt to it. Um, but God, being perfect, there is nowhere better for Him to change. So God is always the same, constantly perfect. What an awesome God we have. And so God created a perfect world, which we uh, put in our five cents and kind of wrecked. But um, he is doing everything to fix it and fix it for those who want it fixed, right? And let's see. So what I want to share through this message is I want to encourage all of us to just not be afraid, not be anxious, and not be stressed. Those three things. Very simple. And so on top of all these government problems, we each are going through our daily problems as well, right? Where we constantly are battled between finances, relationship, jobs, time management, church, and parents, and all, everything in between, right? So we're on top of all this, we have our own problems that we're constantly dealing with. And... Today, we have a lot of reason to be stressed and to be worried, to be scared, to be angry, and some even get passionate and, and violent, right? Uh, start swinging guns around. Uh, but the times right now, they, they aren't very much different from any time in the past in the history. As a matter of fact, we in America, America, we have it way better than majority of the world today or in the past, right? I mean, we have everything. A lot of, uh, a lot of what we have, um, how do I say this right? Our, our want overcomes our need, right? It's like when, I, when we go buy something, we mostly buy what we want and not exactly what we need, right? Because what we need, we already have. H has any of you uh, not ate today? Is there anybody? Please tell me so we could feed you. Because in America, you ought to be fed. Uh, so uh, God has blessed all of us um, abundantly. And, and if not, we'll pray for you and we'll help you. Um, 
and we have all that we want. So we, we, in America, we, have it, we really have it good, you know. Uh, but in the past, in the past, and, and these things may repeat in the future, but in the past, you know, the saints, they overcame a lot of things. And you can look at any, any biblical character you want. Like, they all went through persecutions, through wars, famines, tragedies, rebellions, and so on, so on, so on, so on. Very dreadful and terrible things. And if any of those things would happen here today in America, has any of you ever seen uh, your street being bombed and you driving around uh, bomb craters? I don't think so, right? We really have it good. Uh, God has blessed this country abundantly. And so uh, we as Christian believers, no matter what happens in our life, and even if, God forbid, we're driving around bomb craters, even if... Um, we must not be afraid and just trust and believe that God, who is perfect and unchanging and who created everything perfect and knew the way the whole earth is going to go, he created it perfect. And the things that you're going through, you ought to go through. And they just got to be the way they got to be. And so that's why my message is peace through God's promises. And I am going to um, read a scripture right now, Romans 8.28. I think all of you or most of you know it by heart. All of you should know it by heart. And we know that God causes everything, and I underline everything, to work together for the good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. What a wonderful scripture. See, it says, no matter what happens in your life, everything, I underlined it, that happens in your life, will work together for the better, for good. It will work out for the better. No matter what's happening around you, no matter how terrible, it will work out for the better if there's a contingency. Uh, if you love God and you are called according to his purpose, so you live according to his scripture, right? Or you, you, you obey God's law. And so while like talking about war or natural disaster, disaster persecution or famine is kind of an extreme, right? Um, it is important to keep those in mind um, because... God can lead us through a lot of things. Um, back in the day, my, my dad was talking to me and he said, you think that government change and, and major political moves and, and major changes in like the whole face of the earth and, and countries, you think, it, you think it would take a long time to happen and we would have time to notice and prepare? He goes, two days pass by and you live in an entirely new world with entirely new set of rules. He's like, it's just crazy. When USSR fall apart, like every, all the country just started grabbing their independences and everything started rolling really quick. Um, and same thing with when war break, breaks out. So while, while these are extremes, it is important for us to not be afraid regardless of the circumstance. Regardless of what happens in your life, no matter how bad, no matter where you end up, know and trust that God's promises are true, and we're going to talk about three things that did come true. We're going to talk about three prophecies of the past. Um, God's promises are true. We're going to prove it, and that God's eyes are on you at this very moment. God is watching you. God sees you, knows your every struggle, and he, you are exactly where he saw you would be before the creation of the earth. And so, um, to go further... When we encounter trouble, we just remember that God will never forsake his own, according to Romans 8.28. So the point of my sermon is, I'm going to give three life examples, pointing out that God's promises and his prophecies are real. And through them, I'd like to encourage, strengthen, I'd like to uh, cast out any kind of fear out of you, because fear is not of God. And give you boldness and courage to preach God's word to not only preach, to go tell your friends, to be able to freely speak, stand up for, your, for, your, for your, what you believe in, no matter how oppressed you are, as brother was just talking. Um, the four things, and um, God, God told Joshua, be bold and courageous, for I am with you. Be bold and courageous. And so the call today is be bold and courageous in a time of trouble and have God's peace on your heart. Number, uh, the four things that I'd like for us to keep in mind as we go through the three points are um, point number one is God controls everything. Point number two is his promises are true. Point number three, his prophecies will or have already come true. And 
Number four is you are taken care of. If you're a Christian, God is taking care of you regardless where you are. And so uh, have peace of mind. Have a peace of mind. And that's a gift that God has given us. You know that peace, peace is only given from God. We cannot create our way to it. We cannot think our way through it, through all the problems to create peace. God gives peace to nations who follow his law and to people who follow his law. And this is, it says that it's a gift of God and the world cannot give you peace. So no matter how much all these countries will strive for peace, they will always clash, always fight, always argue, always have differences, except when there is God in their midst, right? When God is in their midst, then they can have peace that the world cannot give them. They can have God's peace. And so going into point number one, and I might have mentioned this first point, promise the other two I have not talked about yet but I might have mentioned this one um, and I want to talk about uh, destruction of temple in Jerusalem and in Matthew 23 it says as Jesus was leaving the temple grounds his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings but he responded he responded do you see all these buildings I tell you the truth they will be completely demolished not one stone will be left on top of another this is God's promise, uh, promise this is God, God's uh, prophecy. This is Jesus saying, what is going to happen in the future to these temples? And it's going to happen to these temples because people, though they have a temple, they don't follow God. Though they have a place to worship God inside their hollow, right? They're like, he, he called Pharisees and Sadducees, he said, you, you guys are like decorated caskets. You guys are empty inside, but you, I mean, full of foul things inside, but beautiful on the outside. And I know I said that before, but um, so they, they had this place of worship, a wonderful church, a wonderful temple. But nobody really cared for God. Nobody really paid attention to God. Nobody really fully tried to follow God. And so Jesus says that you see all these wonderful buildings, all of them will be destroyed. And, and that's done um, through a scripture that says, it came to my own and they did not recognize me. And then he tells him the punishment will be this, that you will be going into uh, exile and the temple will be destroyed. But, um, and so the disciples, they start asking him about the future and the coming. And Jesus spends entire Matthew 23 talking about it. But in the end, he says, he says this, I tell you the truth. This judgment will befall on this very generation. He was talking about the generation he was still living in. So if Jesus was born year zero and he died year 33 and this was somewhere between 30 and 33. That means there were 33 more years until year 66 when Judeans rebelled against Rome. And year 70 AD, Rome came and he, they destroyed the temple. Um, see, uh, Romans, when they came to destroy Jerusalem, to, to destroy this rebellion that arose to, to kill the people who are rebellious, uh, their general told them, please do not destroy the temple. Keep the temple. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, structure. It was one of the marvels of the world, right? The ancient world. And what happened is their ballistas or those, those things that fling rocks and arrows, right? They, they, they aren't as accurate as mo modern technology um, where a tank can hit another tank right under a turret from like two miles out. Um, back in the day, they kind of just flung it and wherever it flew, it flew. And so one of them... Um, hit the temple and the temple caught fire and when you're defending a city you can extinguish the fire and let the enemy in or you can not let the enemy in and then just rebuild the temple so they kind of chose to not let the enemy in the enemy got in anyway and rebellion was extinguished and Jewish people were killed off um, but the temple burnt down right nothing was left of the temple it was just a rubble and what's interesting is on the inside temple had a lot of gold it was gold plated it's beautiful. It was beautiful. It had all kinds of precious stuff. And so when it caught fire, all this stuff melted. All this stuff melted. And fell between the cracks of the floor, between the rocks, and everywhere else into the rubble. And so when Romans were looting the city, their general said, well, the temple did burn down. You guys are welcome to go through the rubble. Whatever gold you find is yours to keep. They dug that thing up so well, not a rock was left on top of a rock because they were looking for gold, right? They were excavating a golden mine. And so Jesus' prophecy came true. Not a rock was left on top of a rock. 
Look how wonderful that is. And so sometimes we, we might get doubtful and we might start wondering, you know, is God really controlling things and is God really doing all of these things in my life when it comes to my job, just me driving somewhere? Is God really in control? And sometimes you kind of just put, put that aside and you, you just live in your life. You kind of just lay it aside. But do not disconnect God from the events that happen in your life. Not a single event is an accident or a chance. God wrote every single one of the things that happened in your life. This is part of God's plan. And so uh, God's in control of everything. His promises are true. His prophecies will come true or have already. In this case, it did. And you are taken care of. Christians are taken care of. Why, how are they taken care of? Well, if we actually read Matthew 23, Jesus said, and when you see the army standing at the gates, um, those who are in the field do not return to the city, and those who are, da, da, you guys know the scripture. Uh, Jesus is warning them that the siege will come very quickly. And historically speaking, the general they came to attack, came to attack, and Caesar dies at the same time. And he wants to be Caesar. So he quickly withdraws his army and goes to take over. And another general takes the army and brings it right back to the city gates. And so that's why the scripture says, when we read, when you see an army standing at the gates, do not return to the city or just pack up and leave quickly. And so all the Christians that know this Jesus' prophecy and know that this is going to happen in our generation and see the army at the gates and then it withdraws real quick, they already know. We are a bounce. The city's over. And so this way, the Christians were preserved, and all the people who did not accept God and who did not believe in God, they were put away. They, they died. See how wonderful God's works are and how marvelous the things that he does are. And this is just one example of three. Example number two is I am going to use Daniel chapter 11. And I read a little bit of this with my guys in Impact Group. Uh, it's a prophecy of Alexander the Great. And we'll just quickly run through it. Now then, I will reveal the truth to you. Do you guys notice how every time Jesus is speaking that it's historically ver verifiable? He says, I speak the truth to you. In the first one, he said, truly, truly, I say to you. So this, this is how you know that you, get, you guys can verify that he speaks the truth. When he says, I speak the truth to you, you can probably look back and say, hey, that is true. Three more Persian kings will reign, and this is Daniel talking. He lived during Pers uh, Persian time. He said, three more Persian kings will reign and will be succeeded by the fourth, far richer than others. He will use his wealth, he will use all the money he has, to stir up everyone to fight against the kingdom of Greece. That's where we get the Battle of Mar Marathon, and that's where we get movie 300. Those are true stories. Uh, so Gre uh, Persia invades Greece. And that's, this is the king, and it's talking about Xerxes, Battle of Marathon and Thermopolis, I think. Uh, and so then a mighty king will arise to power, who will rule with great authority and accomplish everything he sets out to do. So another king arises, and he will rule with great power, and he will finish everything he sets out to do. This is talking about Alexander the Great. Sometime later... Mr. Alexander the Great gets his army together. He unites all the Greece together and he goes and he accomplishes everything he set out to do. He took all of Persia and all the, went all the way into India. Like he had the biggest empire at that time, bigger than Roman Empire. And it continues to say in verse 4, but at the height of his power, his kingdom will be broken apart and divided into four parts. This is also talking about Alexander because he died without having a kid. Alexander never had a son. And so his army, his, his country was divided into four and giving, given the way to his, uh, his four generals. Romans tie in later into the, with, with those generals. Um, but it says, it will not be ruled by king's descendants, nor will the kingdom hold the authority it once had for the, for the empire will be uprooted and given to others. And so another one of these comes to pass. Another, another of, this is Daniel's prophecy, and it was like 200 years, I believe, 200 years before Alexander was even alive. So God once again 
in another example speaks and says that this will happen, this will happen, this many kings will be more, then another one will rise and destroy this empire, and his empire will be divided into da 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 da. So the point the point here is um, that it did come to pass, that God's word is true and accurate, that it's historically verifiable. It's so amazing when you read the scripture and you know history, you're like, Are you kidding? Like, I know this story, but this this is this book is written way before like how is that even possible you know how is that possible but god he god says that he never keeps us christians in in a fog right god always tells us what he's gonna do he says i no longer call you slaves but friends because i have revealed all of my plans to you and guess what at the end at the end of the world we win god already told us hey we win it's awesome to be on the winning side. Join us. Uh, join God. We win. Um, why would you fight for a side that is de destined to, be, to, be, to lose, to, to die? Why would you fight for that? If you know which side is going to win, join it. And so God is calling today and he's saying, hey, my words are true. And he says, I speak truth to you. This is verifiable. This is historically accurate. So let me tell you this. God knows what he's doing. He knows why he's doing it, how to do it, and when to do it. He allowed Alexander the Great to take over, to let everybody speak Greek, and most of New Testament is written in Greek. So gospel could be further spread. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that amazing? How God just works. And so all these terrible things happen, and people ask us, why are so many terrible things happen? If there is a God, why is there this, or why is there that? Or is God not watching? Or is God not protecting all those people? Well, all these things in a big picture, a man cannot see. Because a man doesn't know what's going to happen in five minutes. I don't know what's going to happen in five minutes. None of us do. We think we know, but we really don't. And, and so, um, and not, not even talking about tomorrow, right? And so we, we think we know what's going to happen, but we really don't. But God, he has everything in control. And God is taking care of everything and God cares for you God controls everything his promises are true his prophecies come true and you are taken care of once again his scripture was spread through this example and the last example I might dwell on the longest and for those of you that hate history I'll try to make it as least painful as possible but it is a favorite subject of mine, and Bible is closely knit with it. And if you understand it too, you just, it's, it's, I can't even explain it. It's like a brand new car to a guy who loves cars. Um, <laughs> or like a, 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 a new, a new, uh, new gym for a guy who likes to work out like Vic. Um, so example number three will be a city of Tyre. There's, there's the city called Tyre. It's spelled with a T-Y, not, not a tire for your car. Uh, T-Y-R-E. And God says the following. I'm going to read from Ezekiel 26, and I will read 14 verses. Bear with me. On February 3, during the 12th year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, this message came to me from the Lord. And this is Ezekiel speaking. Son of man. Tyre has re rejoiced over the fall of Jerusalem, saying, Ha! She who has the gateway, who was the gateway to the rich trade routes to the east has been broken. Now I am the heir. Because she has been made desolate, I will become wealthy. And so here we see that the city of Tyre, it is rejoicing, it is happy that Jerusalem was destroyed. You see, anytime anybody's ever trying to destroy you and they're gladly doing it, anytime this world is oppressing you and they're gladly doing it, God's justice and God's, I want to say revenge, God says, leave your revenge to me. Don't, don't go trying to repay somebody. See, the city was rejoicing that Jerusalem was destroyed. The city was rejoicing that God's people were being taken away and destroyed and killed. And so anytime the devil oppresses you or the people are oppress you, they laugh at you. They think that what you believe in is foolish. Just know that destruction follows those who mock God's people. Destruction follows those who do not believe because they don't believe. 
Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am your enemy, O Tyre, and I will bring many nations against you like the waves of the sea crashing against your shoreline. And you will, you will understand why, why I'm reading all this. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and tear down its towers. I will scrape away its soil and make it a bare rock. It will be as a rock on a sea, a place for fishermen to spread their nets. For I have spoken, says the sovereign Lord. Tyrant will become prayer, pray, prey to many nations. And its mainland villages will be destroyed by the sword. Then they will know that I am the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. For the nor from the north I will bring Nebuchadnezzar, a Babylonian against Tyre. He is king of kings and brings his horses, chariots, charioteers, and great army. First, he will destroy their mainland villages. Then he will attack you by building a siege wall, constructing a ramp, and raising a roof of shields against you. He will pound your walls with battering rams and demolish your towers. And on and on it goes. And it says that, um, I will make your island a bare rock, a place for fishermen to spread their nets. You will never be rebuilt, for I, the Lord, have spoken. Yes, the sovereign Lord has spoken. And so what's interesting to note is, Ezekiel spoke this in 586 BC, and 16 years later, Nebuchadnezzar brings his army, and this exact thing happens. City of Tyre is destroyed. City of Tyre is no more. And... City of Tyre has been burned to the ground. But he also says that I will bring many nations to you. And he also talks about make, uh, making it a bare rock and, and that he will destroy the island of it. So if you guys want to, so, so you guys would understand, I will illustrate a little bit. So the city of Tyre is on a coast. It's right by the water. And just off the shore, there's a little island. It's not very, not, not very little, but not very big. 5,000 men were stationed in that island. And Nebuchadnezzar destroyed all of this, but then later, Alexander the Great is on his conquest, and we just talked about him. He's on his conquest, and he's going south from Greece, coming up to Jerusalem. There's a nation called Lebanon, present-day Lebanon, and there's a city of Tyre that was there. And he encounters, the city of Tyre was destroyed as prophesied. He says, I will destroy your ma mainland villages and make them desolate. Da, 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 da. So all of that was already gone. And then there's this little island. And he knows, Alexander knows that they have, they have a lot of ships and they have big tall walls and they have cattle. You just can't do anything about it. So what he does is straight according to the prophecy. He takes the rubble of the old city of Tyre, scrapes it bare, scrapes it, makes it a bare rock, like the scripture says, and builds a bridge to the island because he can't attack it with ships. They're too strong on ships. And it's a couple miles, off, or it's like a mile off the shore, or not even, I don't know, like it, it's, it's, it's off the shore. You, you, you can't make it, they're walking. And so he builds a long bridge making the city bare. Exactly according to the scripture. And so everything is under God's control. God's promises are true. His, promise, his uh, prophecies come to pass. And what's fascinating is they come to pass exactly as they are told. And his people are taken care of. His people are taken care of. Um, because God repaid their joy for Jerusalem being destroyed, right? Um, going further, uh, the, these three examples, you know, uh, of the prophecies, um, they pass in great detail, and we're not even talking about Jesus' prophecies of him coming to life and then dying on a cross. The uh, reason we looked at these is so we can look at this and say, even through chaos, even through destruction, God's word is always standing. God's word is standing today, and God has given us many, many promises, many, many contingencies that if you live like this and like this, I will bless you. And then if you live like this and like this, I will prosper you. And if you abstain from sin and if you keep yourself holy, then I will be your God. And if you live according to my purpose um, and, and everything that is in your life, it's working out for the better. Those are God's promises. Um, 
So I want to say that um, even if some people question this and say, is it true though? Like, is it true? What if, what if Ezekiel and Daniel wrote all this after it happened, right? Well, first of all, that, that, there would be no point for his books. But secondly, um, if let, let's just say that did happen, right? Then God's saying that the, 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 one of the things God said was an ongoing commitment, ongoing commitment. He said, you will never be rebuilt. And if we look at Lebanon today, and if we find little villages of Tyre that are just very loosely spread, we will see that the, the spot where the old city was is now nature reservation site number 980. Wetland Freshwater Habitat, Ramsaw Convention. It's illegal to build there because it's wetland. If that's not crazy and if that's a coincidence, then I don't even know. Like, isn't that just crazy? Isn't that crazy? How God said, you will never be rebuilt and today it is illegal to build there. Like, wow. So if you say, maybe it was written after, well, how, how does this make sense? How do, you, how do you add this? The math just doesn't work here. The only explanation I have is, our God is real. Our God is powerful. Our God is all-knowing. And our God knows everything. And so maybe some people are like, oh, what if we get invaded? What if America comes to peril? What if this and that happens? And what if him or her take over? What, what's going to happen? I want to say don't be distracted and don't be fooled. No matter what happens in your life, of course we want what's best, but no matter what happens in your life, and I'm going to round, out to, round up to prayer here, if I could have somebody on keys. Um, no matter what happens in your life, I want to say that God is in control. God's divine power is in control. And so if you guys could just all imagine that God, who knows how all of these events and all of these things throughout history and every single person, he knows exactly how they tightly knit together. He has it all figured out. We can't, we can't comprehend even the basic details, and I've been talking for like almost half hour. These are like the basic details. Uh, but God has all of this tightly created under control. And so that same God sees you today sees you right now sitting on his throne and you're a part of something great. You're a part of his kingdom. You're a part of his ministry. You're a part of this church. I hope you're a part of God. I hope you serve him whole, wholeheartedly because God, his words are true. And if God says that those who do not serve me will go to hell and have eternal condemnation, then those words are true. Those words are true. And so I want to say you're not an accident. You're not a random chance. You are a child of God. And God himself said, you are my child. So surrender everything to God today. Surrender your anxiety. Surrender your worries and your struggles. Because all of these little things God already has figured out. All of these little things God already knows. What's important is to live for his kingdom. And everything else is just going to go the course it's going to go. And, and everything is just going to glorify God furthermore, as it always has, as it always will. And Jesus says, be still and know I am God. He's in charge. He's calling us to be still. He's calling us to humble ourselves. And the, the, the best way to come to God is to remove all pride. I'll have you guys rise. The, the, be, the, best, the best way to come to God is to remove all pride. And Jesus says, be still. Only when we're calm, only when we're, we're in presence of God is we're truly still. And we can truly understand and surrender ourselves and truly find God. And he says, come follow me and you'll find rest for your souls. What is soul? We've been singing about it. Our soul today we said it's well with my soul it is well with my soul your soul is your true and bare self without any makeup without any money the inner being that you are that is what Jesus came after he did not come to rule a nation he didn't come to be wealthy to build himself a home he came after your soul 
And so today is the day of repentance and today is the day of peace. Today is the day to lay down all those things at Jesus' feet and, and just carry your cross. Carry your cross and follow Jesus. And all things, they work in our favor. There's just nothing that could dismay us, nothing that could push, push us aside. And so today I want to say, if you have been distracted, if you had this, this king or this bad fruit as Brother Igor is praying, life and you've been chasing after your distraction you've been striving after it you didn't have any peace in your heart you're anxious you're worried or if you just want a prayer in your struggle today with every head bowed and every eye closed if that's you today if you just say God I want to I want to focus on you I want to focus on what's important I want to focus on a big picture and not my small self not on my selfish desires I don't want it easy. I, I, I want to see the big picture. I want to be part of something grand and amazing. And God reveals it to us. God always reveals his plans. God is wonderful like that. God will give you a vision in accordance. Plan in accordance. So after, if that's you today, if you want to repent or if you want to, if you want to, if you want to just come to God and you want to pray, if you want to lose all anxiety and stress, and have God's peace that is given graciously. It is God's gift. The world cannot give it to you. Only Jesus can. If that's you today, on the count of three, please raise your hand. One, two, three. Thank you. I see your hand. I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand.